So I'm going to level with you. When Andrew called me earlier this year and invited me to come speak at PopTech, I freaked out. I thought, I can't get up there in front of 500 people and the untold thousands online. I'm not a brilliant scientist. I'm not a Clay Shirky or a Malcolm Gladwell. And then I stopped, and I thought about it. And I remembered. It's not about me. It's not about Clay or Malcolm. It's not about you or he or she. It's about the ideas. It's about the great and good ideas that people in the audience and people on the stage have gotten hearts and their minds and their bodies behind and gotten them activated to make the world a better place. And I have one of those ideas, and I'm going to talk to you about it, if I can find my clicker. There we go. I'm going to start here. There we go. So, video games can change the world for the better. This is a, an idea I believed in for a long time. I'm going to talk to you about this idea. I'm going to tell you why it is a good idea, and I'm going to let you know about ways that you can get involved. But first, I'm going to tell you a story. I've always believed in the power of popular culture to transform people, the intersection of popular culture and meaningful messages. Even as a kid, I used to listen to Bob Dylan, and I watched M.A.S.H., um, even this crazy little show called Davy and Goliath. Did anyone ever see Davy and Goliath? I mean, Totally hokey show, right? Hokey show, but very meaningful in that it really was thought-provoking. Those are the kinds of things that shaped me as a person. When I got out of school, I decided I wanted to make some meaningful media. So I decided to go and work for, naturally, PBS. I was working at PBS in my early 20s, and um, I was working on a, a show about this lovely guy, it's Frontline. There's a program on PBS called Frontline. Does anyone recognize this lovely guy? <laughs> Any guesses? David Duke. Very good. You could probably tell by his eyes or something, right? <laughs> so a, an editor in the suite next to me as I was working um, wanted to thank me for the work that I was doing. So he gave me this diskette, floppy disk. These are the days of floppy disk. <coughs> Video game. Who cares? Stick it in my pocket. Forgot all about it. 20-something. I was on my way that night up to upstate New York where we were having a big bash and a bonfire and I really wanted to um, get up there soon. I was changing for the party and I found this diskette in my pocket. What am I going to do with this diskette? All right, I'll just play it for a couple minutes until we, want, we go downstairs for the party. So, I stuck the floppy disk in my Mac SE, which is like a Mac at that point looks like a basketball in a box. And, I didn't get up for the next six hours. <laughs> Hidden agenda. I should say first that I love a party. You'll probably find that out tonight. And <laughs> for me to miss a party is a really big deal. Hidden agenda is a game about Central American politics. It engages you in the role of a president of a fictional country. And these are the heady days of the Sandinistas in the Contras. It was a complicated environment. We had a lot of information coming at us from newspapers, radios. I got more out of this game than I had ever gotten from any basic media that I had been reading or hearing about. I was immersed in the issues. I was able to explore the content in this very compelling way, and I was transformed. So I said, where can I get more of these games? I want more. So, whoops, I went to the Game Developers Conference in search of these new games. I thought maybe I'd find my tribe there in this mass of mostly white guys with long stringy ponytails. <laughs> um, I thought maybe, you know, in the corner I'd find the guys with the, or the people with the ponchos and the Birkenstocks and they'd be making meaningful games, right? Needless to say, I didn't make a ton of friends um, and I didn't find any of these games. This game, Hidden Agenda, was an anomaly. I did learn some other things, though. I learned, one, the game industry is a very risk-averse place for good reason. Games fail. 80 to 90% of all games fail. Very hard to make a good game. They're focused on the bottom line. And they're making great entertainment games. But they don't take a lot of risks because they can't. Two, I learned there were no lines at the ladies' room. 
<laughs> I like that. I thought I can stick around for a while, so I decided to stick around for a while. And finally, something perhaps most compelling to me, games are a young medium. They're a medium growing up. And as a young medium, <coughs> young media are often misunderstood. So I'm going to show you some other young media when they were misunderstood. So this is what Voltaire says about books. The written word, says Plato, thanks to you and your invention, your pupils will be widely read without benefit of a teacher's instruction, making them incapable of real judgment. The written word. Novels. I think you're getting the idea. This is my favorite one. Suffering, intellectual and moral injury. Moby Dick, don't even touch it. Very dangerous stuff. Film, same idea. You're getting the idea. So let's look back at some of these media. I, knew I have to speed up now, so we're going to go really fast. This is the first feature film. Many people consider the first feature film. Cops and robbers, two hours, long. that's all they do, shoot each other. This is the first television show. A fight. The early web. I'm so sorry I can't show you this image. I'm sure you'd like a little lift right about now, but. OK, some early video games. Very basic themes, space wars, gunfight. More early video games. Who can tell me what game this is? GTA, very good. Where do, what do we know? Games are growing up. Everybody is playing games. Average gamer is 35 and getting older rivaling Hollywood at the box office. Some would say a lot like where we were with film in the 60s and 70s. Games are being collected as cultural artifact. Artists are using them, universities. If film was the dominant cultural form in the 20th century, interactive media and games are that of the 21st. So, Pew Report. This came out a couple weeks ago, very compelling. 97% of all teenagers are playing games. That's across the board. Popular games are not violent and not puzzle, the two most popular games. Heavy game playing doesn't mean they're not being civically engaged. Meaningful civic experiences and games actually have a correlation with increased civic experiences in real life. I, I put that chicken and egg there because they don't know which way that goes. All right, if anyone's falling asleep, this is a slide you have to wake up for, then you can go back to sleep again. Most important slide. Video games are learning devices. Imagine you've never seen a tic-tac-toe board before. What do you know? What can you do? Nothing. First thing you have to do, learn the rules. What's the next thing you have to do? Learn how to win. What's the next thing you have to do? Learn how to get better. Lear games are learning devices. They're vehicles to get you better and better at something. Perfect environment for learning. You can go back to sleep now. <laughs> Especially for a slide like this. This is one of those slides you go, oh no, don't worry. I could spend an hour on this slide, but you don't want me to, and I don't want to. And in fact, there are people who can tell you this much better than I can. Games are great for learning. You should get your hands on anything and everything James Paul G, you can write that down, has written, and he will convince you. By the end, games are a perfectly designed learning environment. In fact, Somebody at a major foundation who will be nameless said this recently at a conference. Total credibility, perfectly designed learning environment. I would like to take the time to talk about these two very important aspects, very important to our conversation today. I'm actually going to go over here and read them because um, this is important. So, games allow you to explore new worlds and new perspectives. We know that already. What makes games fun? Flying an airplane, having magic, going to the moon, new perspectives, being a president. What's it like to be a president? What does it feel like to be a god? What does it feel like to be a president who thinks he's a god? Sorry, I had to throw that out there. OK, second thing, very important. Complex problem solving. Many experts in my field would say that games are fostering a new kind of systems thinking. The ability to understand and manage complex systems and solve problems within those systems. There are already companies hiring kids, people who are good gamers. Why are they doing that? They hire gamers for their unique and evolving abilities to manage systems and to solve problems from a systems perspective. 
Leading educators in the field say that systems thinking is a key to 21st century success. The 21st century problems require 21st century skills. Perhaps parents should not worry so much about their kids playing too many games and worry more that their kids aren't playing enough of these new games, well-designed games with learning objectives and real-world applications. So, my husband works for the Secretary General of the UN. I asked him the other night while I was preparing my talk, what are the things that are most important to solving world problems? And this is what he said. Ability to see other sides' perspective, understanding of the complexity and interrelated nature of problems. <coughs> Sorry, to toggling back. Think about these two things about games. Think about how they line up with these two things. I'm going to let you read these while I. Everyone read them? So the last one seems like a bit of a stretch. But imagine, if before every meeting, imagine if this were true for future leaders. Future leaders of Middle East conflict were required to play through the other person's perspective and win. That's already happening. Who gets it? OK, tell me, someone in the audience, what is the major institution that is often first to new technology for their own unique needs? Very good. They are making lots of games. America's Army is the number one recruiting tool the military uses. It's one of the top 10 first-person shooters. It's the only first-person shooter given away for free. Totally successful, popular. What do we know? <coughs> read. You can all read. <laughs> Luckily. What do we need? We need new games. The industry isn't making them yet. They've got bigger fish to fry. We're going to make them. Games for Change, this is what we do. <coughs> Supporting nonprofit for not social impact games. We, act, we don't make the games themselves. We act like Sundance did. We support the emerging field. <coughs> Hopefully, I'm not helping the transformative power of video games. <laughs> oh, thank God, it's a video. Finally you get to see the games. From ABC News headquarters in New York, this is World News. And Games for Change, the popular new video game designed to save the world. And coming up after a quick break, it sounds like a computer programmer's fantasy and a parent's fantasy as well. Video games that do good. Video games are often accused of wasting time or even promoting violence, but there are some popular new games that have a pretty lofty goal, saving the world. Here's ABC's Andrea Canning. Please. I'm your officer in charge for this World Food Program mission. Our job is to do an aerial assessment to get an accurate picture of the food crisis. Your mission in the new video game, Food Force? To save millions from starvation in the war-ravaged nation of Ceylon. You can see there will be no harvest this year. Ceylon may be fictitious, but its problems aren't. The video game has been downloaded four million times, and it's one of dozens of socially responsible games bringing issues like the environment and the dark war crisis to your fingertips. Getting involved is part of the game. Survival of the camp is also assisted by you spreading the word about the game and about Darfur. Think of the concept as the opposite of the ultra-popular and ultra-violent Grand Theft Auto. We think games have the potential to have a positive and powerful impact on society. Games are really good for exploring complex social issues. And there's no issue more complex than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So former Israeli intelligence officer Asi Borak created Peacemaker. Gamers can attempt to achieve Mideast peace by playing as the Israeli prime minister or the Palestinian president. 
you can actually dive into a situation and make decisions. I mean, this is very, very powerful. At this institute in Tel Aviv, they use Peacemaker to help Israeli and Palestinian teenagers understand the conflict better. I played in the, the Palestinian side, and suddenly I saw what is going on in their side. That's so awesome. Those are great games. So, yay! So, how are we doing this primarily? Oh my gosh, the time. <clears throat> Do I get a coughing allowance? Okay, so, <laughs> we're bringing experts together. I bet everyone in this room falls into one of these categories. What do we do? We have an annual festival. We have workshop, toolkit, listserv, online resources, <clears throat> lots of stuff, net neutrality, or even a part of something called the Corporation for Public Gaming, which is about making a public space for games. <coughs> you can read these. <coughs> these are some of our partners. MTV, United Nations, a lot of people are caring about this. I want to single out Microsoft. You see Microsoft, Xbox, and XNA. They're taking a lead in this space. They're not making these games, as I talked about. They're actually got bigger fish to fry, but they have been incredibly supportive of the work we do. And their toolkit, XNA, allows people like you and me and people in our community to make games about relevant issues. Very important. These games get a ton of press. They help raise awareness, not only because for the games, but they help raise awareness of the issues. You make a game about Darfur, Darfur gets ink. Most importantly, kids are playing these games. Grown-ups are playing these games. Four million players on Food Force. I'm going to let you read these. <coughs> Real-world actions, including letters to Congress. Well, I'm going to tell you about a special moment that happened last year. We had our fifth annual festival last year, and we wanted a really special keynote. You've got to be scratching your head right now wondering, what is the Honorable Sandra Day O'Connor Justice doing at, our, at a game conference? Guess what? Now you're going to be plugging your ears. Sorry for all the <laughs> personal grooming that goes on when I speak. She's making a game. She is making a game. <coughs> um, she learned that kids could recognize an American Idol judge sooner than they could recognize a Supreme Court justice, and she was concerned. So she did her research. As I understand, she's pretty good at research, and she decided the games and interactive media were the best way to reach young people in, in, on their own turf about serious issues. Our Courts is the name of it. Six to 12 months you'll be seeing this game. <coughs> Free game for middle schoolers to engage them in the process of government. We're back here. We need new games. I need your help to make these new games. I want to stop for a moment. And this is my last slide. Um, and I want to let you know that I have a seven-year-old <coughs> named Tatiana. And she's watching right now from home. Hi, Tatiana. I love you. And this talk is for her. It's hard for me to be away from you. And I'm sorry when I travel. I know you had a hard time last night, and I did too. But I travel because I really want to make new games for you to play. Games that help you learn what a great and beautiful country and planet we have. And games that will help you learn how we can take better care of our country. So I'm here to ask the people in the audience to help make new games for Tatiana and help make new games for all our kids. Thank you so much.